The piece I have on the bench today is going to make any classic audiophile drool. I've never seen one of these units before, and I've been working on stereo equipment for many, many years. This uh, piece is mine. It was given to me by uh, a customer who was looking for a good home for his vintage stuff, and he donated a whole bunch of stuff to me. And, uh, well, let's take a look, but you guys are going to love this one. What do you think of that for a cassette deck? This is the Techniques by Panasonic 676. This is a beautiful tape deck. And you know what? This thing here weighs about 30 pounds. This is ridiculous how heavy this thing is. Solid. I haven't plugged it in yet. This is my unit. I had a, a customer that I was working at and uh, we got to talking about stereo gear and I was telling him that I restore old equipment and stuff and he, he opens up his, his basement and he goes, you want this? And he gave me this unit and he gave me a beautiful set of, of uh, SB7000A loudspeakers. Incidentally, they have a 14 inch woofer, five inch mid range dome tweeter. The sound quality on those is unbelievable. They have become my new favorite speakers. They are so accurate and sensitive. Even on my little tube amplifier, I can rattle the windows. The fellow that gave me this, he actually used to uh, operate a Techniques dealership. So he had all top of the line equipment. And he's long retired and uh, getting up there in the years, he was looking for a home for his equipment. So I got a whole stack of equipment. And this is the first piece I'm gonna look at just because this one's so classic. So uh, let's get the top off this one before I even power it up. I wanna check it out and see what it looks like inside. I mean, look at this, it has separate side panels. Okay, they're, they're particle board with with a, a veneer. I guess it's probably vinyl veneer. You got a veneer covering, veneer cover uh, on it. Uh, it looks like, yeah, it's gonna be a wood veneer. Doesn't feel like vinyl, it feels like wood. Metal is top, or the, the top is metal on this unit. The matching receiver is the same, but it has a real wood cover on it. So top cover should lift off this thing. Get a load of that. This is a piece of art. Unbelievable, look at the transformer's got a shield around it. It's got a metal shield around it for magnetic shielding. Look at the switches on this thing. This is just amazing. No, I'm not selling this unit, by the way. There's no way in hell I'm gonna let this sucker go. This is, uh, this one is certainly one for the books. The specs on this thing here, it's got, uh, it only has two tape types. It'll support normal and chrome. So it won't even work with metal tape. Just normal and chrome. It's Dolby B noise reduction. You've got Dolby in, and you can record with the FM MPX filter on or off. When the MPX filter is on, it limits the frequency response to about 15 kilohertz so that the the uh, pilot tone that will leak through from the stereo decoder won't beat with the bias, the record bias oscillator. So you can turn on the filter and that'll, of course, reduce the beating. It also has Dolby FM decoder, so if you're listening to a radio station that at the time was broadcasting with the Dolby FM emphasis, this could decode it. Check out the front panel. Okay, here's your tape selector. It's got Dolby FM calibration controls that you would calibrate to a Dolby FM radio station. And how that was done was Dolby FM stations at night would generally transmit a tone at a certain time for calibrating equipment. They would calibrate the transmitter at night. And what you could do is, if you knew what time it was going to be done, and you could find that out by contacting the station engineer, uh, any of the uh, stations, nobody uses Dolby FM anymore, I don't think, but 
back in the 70s, Dolby FM was trying, they were trying to gain traction with it, the same as they were trying to gain traction with uh, quad, uh, quad sound, quadraphonic uh, FM, which of course never got off the ground, but they tried for a while. But what you would do is you'd contact the station, talk to engineering and, and ask them, when are you going to be running your calibration tones for your Dolby FM? I want to calibrate my tape deck. And the engineer would say, oh, we're going to do it on Sunday night at midnight or whatever, right? And then there was a, a time where the station would actually go off the air temporarily and they would run tones. And the engineer, they, they would announce, make an announcement that they were going to be running some um, engineering tests on the transmitter. And that if you had Dolby FM equipment, this is a time where you could calibrate it. They would send out a tone and you would adjust it so that you had... I think you, 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 you hit it, you set it up to the Dolby mark, if I remember right, when you were calibrating it. But anyway, um, it's been a long time. I never had a Dolby FM receiver. Actually, I do have a Dolby FM receiver. I have a Sansui 9090 DB, which has got Dolby FM in it, but it's, it's already pre-calibrated. But I never had the option of having to use that because, of course, Dolby FM went the way that quadraphonic broadcasting went. In other words, it never really got off the ground, kind of like DBX. Anyway, I've um, got a balance here, got a record level, and a record balance here. Um, mic level, because you can pl plug two microphones into it, so it has mic mixing, I guess, does it? No, uh, yes it does. You can choose mic only, mic and line input, and tuner and mic input. Hmm, tuner, huh? Does this have a tuner input? Let's turn it around. And of course, there it is. You've got your line output, each with an independent output control for calibration. You've got your line input, and you've got your tuner input. And the reason you've got the tuner input, and here's your Dolby FM de-emphasis, either 75 microseconds or 25 microseconds. The reason it has a separate tuner input is if you were receiving a Dolby FM broadcast, you would plug your tuner directly in to the tape deck, and that way you could utilize the Dolby circuits in here to decode Dolby FM by switching this over to tuner mic. And it would then pass the signal through from one side to the other. And that's how you calibrated the tones because in tuner mode, the record level is not doing anything, right? Except for when you're in record. But when you're passing a signal through for um, setting up Dolby, you set your levels here with these adjustments. Power. Hey, it lights up. Oh, the light even lights up in here. Now check this out. You guys think this is a front loading deck, right? Eh, wrong. It's not. It's a, it's a top loading deck that you load from the front. You actually put the tape in and press it down. Cool, huh? You see? Tape goes in, down like that. Has a nice mirror there. So you can actually see what's going on. Oh, I'm loving this deck already. And I, I'm itching to see whether it even works before I do anything to it. So let me grab a tape. We'll hook this thing up. I want to see if this thing will do anything at all. It's been sitting for years, so it wouldn't surprise me if it doesn't work, but it's worth a try, right? So power on. What shall we try? Shall we try? Fast forward. It runs. How about rewind? It runs and rewind too. A moment of truth. I do believe it plays. Let's uh, try something that I'm actually able to play. Uh, let's check the speed first of all. I have my tone tape here and we'll, we'll check out the speed and see how good the speed is. Damn, that sounds pretty close to me. We know the date when this thing was made, by the way. Uh, this motor was made on November 17th, 1976. There might be a speed adjustment on this. This looks like this might be a speed regulator. The motor is connected to this little board here. I bet you this is a speed regulator board here. Let's just see. I believe that's a speed regulator. Yeah, that sounds better. Okay. We'll get it right on 
440. That's close enough for me. You gotta love this deck. Look at this. You can see the tape in here. It has a mirror. So you can see the tape playing. How cool is that? And it's lit up. There's a light in there lighting up the tape. I guess that's the end of my... It's got a memory playback on it too, so when it gets to zero, it'll stop and go back into play. And you notice that the play button it has a light behind it, as does the pause and the record. The fast forward and rewind, however, do not. But you know what? Who cares? They don't have a light. That one does. Oop, what happened there? I do believe we need to clean some record play switches. That's what that is. Yeah, we got some. We got record play switches we need to clean. But hey, it's, uh, what, 42 years old, so I expect to have to do something to it, right? It, it, it can't work just perfect. Let's clean those switches. And for this, I'll use the good cleaner. Of course, the switches are underneath here. Uh, check this out. When you press the record button, there's just this great big giant solenoid that moves this lever which operates the record switches underneath it. Watch. I gotta pull the bottom off to uh, get at the switches to clean them. Now you see this wheel down here? This is the auto stop. If there's a light that shines through there, there's a photo to cell, and you can see the light. It's an incandescent bulb. You can see it glowing there. When you're in play or any other mode, that wheel turns. If we look at the belt, it's a good thing I it's a good thing I operated this when I did, because you can see that that belt was probably ready to fall apart. But now that we've got the belt moving, it probably will be okay. Because of course, the worst thing for these belts was letting them sit. That was the absolute worst thing was letting them sit. If you exercise these belts, they will last a lot longer. But when they sit in one state without moving. They tend to uh, go bad. Same with rubber idlers. If they get used, they tend to last a lot longer. I'm going to pull the bottom off this thing now to get in there and clean that switch. So you guys ready for this? Check out the bottom. Okay, got a motor for the tape spools, forward and reverse. And here is the capstan motor with this giant belt, which is in really good shape, and the big flywheel. So you know that this thing's not going to have much wow and flutter. Wow. You know, it's, uh, you've even thought about this for, for pulling the flywheel out, which I, I don't think I'm going to need to do on this thing because I don't think we're going to get into a lubrication problem on it. But to, if, if I were to lubricate it, you pull the front bezel off. And as you can see, there's a cutaway here in the chassis so that when the front bezel is removed, there's space to drop down the flywheel for when that eventually needs to be done. Now I gotta get at the board here, so I'm going to have to, I guess, pull the board out, I think, to get into the switches with some cleaner. There's a switch here, and there's a switch there, and a switch there that I do need to clean. But this thing's got full of relays. What does this one do? That's another, I might be able to get to that switch from here, actually. But there's another switch here. Let's just see what they do. I will make noise when it's not when it's on its side. Probably because it's not meant to, to operate on its side, but there's the record switch. That's the solenoid for pause. Looks like that lever. Could be cleaned up. Here's how the Dolby FM works. If you've got your tuner plugged in, and you flip it to Dolby FM in. As you can see, that switches the Dolby FM circuits in. So if you're receiving a Dolby FM broadcast, and that's how you would calibrate this. 
when the station sent out their calibration tone, you'd flip your Dolby FM switch on and you would adjust it to the plus 3 dB, which is where the little Dolby indicator is. I think that's where you set it up. Set it to there and uh, that was calibrated then. You know, and then it only took a minute or two to do it when the stations were at it. Also notice that the motor itself is mounted with rubber grommets. So not only is it isolated by the belt itself, but the motor itself is isolated from causing any vibrations into the chassis that could possibly cause vibrations on the tape. Right, this motor's not, this one's rigidly mounted, mounted, but this one here, the capstan motor is isolated. Ah, that's what it is. That's your chrome and normal tape selector. Let's say, I'll just say everything, everything is solenoid driven. It is just amazing. You got all these relays over here because you could get a remote control for this unit as well, right? There was a, a wired remote control. You unscrew this port on the back and there was a plug here and it's got wires in place now because there is no remote control. But you would remove these jumper wires and you plugged in a remote control and it gave you all the functions from the front from a, a remote which meant that this tape deck would have been geared up for use in a radio station for example where it could be queued up and operated by the disc jockey from the console so you could have this up on a rack and they could have a bunch of these have them all set up and they're all hardwired back to the console and he would have a, a keypad that was identical so he could fast forward, rewind, stop, etc. So they could play programming back on the air from one of these units. They could also, I'm sure, be set for uh, monitor recording, which is what radio stations quite often would do is they would, they would have a, their transmitter off-air service would be recorded for quality checks and they could have it remotely controlled so the deck could be sitting in a rack and be controlled by the engineer, for example. Okay, I think it's time to uh, let's see. I'm gonna see how I can get into the switch to clean it. I think I gotta pull the board out though to get in there reliably. I'm gonna have to pull this board. I just want to make sure that nothing's gonna come off when I do it. Okay, let's get the board pulled out and cleaned. And in case nobody's noticed, the board was made by Elna. This is, this is the amplifier block. I don't think this unit has ever been apart. And I've certainly never opened up one of these units before, but there's another board on the top here that's coming down through here. Does it unplug by chance or it might unplug? I may have to unplug this board first. Yeah, this board unplugs. So there's another board on top here that I have to unplug first because it uh, it's going to prevent me from removing the other one, but there it is, it's unplugged. Now this board can uh, drop out of the way. And I can get at the switches and get in there with my fancy cleaner. Here are my switches here that I need to clean. Check out the capacitors with the, the little standoffs here on the board. Little spacers they've got on 
all the capacitors, it looks like, the, uh, even, even some of the tantalum caps, they have pieces of tubing on the leads. Isn't that cool? You know, and, and these are all precision resistors in here, you know, precision of the day, right? These were, uh, you know, 5% tolerance, and back in the 70s, uh, you know, you would see the good old silver band, 10%. You very rarely saw resistors with the gold band on them, which was the 5% tolerance. We used to see that most of the most of the resistors of the day had the silver band, which was your 10% tolerance. And you see, these are all 5%. I think red was 2%. Um, but uh, and no band was 20%. That's what it was. But uh, anyway, um, and now of course the resistors we've got today are all 1% precision. But by the standards in 1976. Nothing, virtually nothing had 5% taller resistors in them. I mean, these are just, you know, fantastic. Fantastic constructs. This would have been a very expensive deck in its day. You know, this was not a, a low-end, cheap deck. This was the top of the line that Techniques offered back then. And in 1976, Techniques was a powerhouse brand. There was The, the battle was between uh, Techniques and Sansui. And, uh, and who else was the big ones back then? <clears throat> Marantz. Marantz and uh, Techniques and Sansui. They were the, the, the ones that were really battling it out. Pioneer was also in there. Pioneer came in a little bit later. But uh, Pioneer was another big powerhouse uh, manufacturer, uh, the Japanese. Um, that, you know, they, they just turned out one after another of just fantastic two-channel audio stuff that's uh, worth quite a bit of money today for collectors and I mean when you see something like this this is this is heritage stuff right it, it just it, it's, it's good it's as good as it got it really it's, it's only gonna be a two-head deck and it doesn't support metal tape well what do you do you can't get metal tape today anyway and you couldn't get metal tape back then because it hadn't been invented but uh, you could record on chrome Regular and ferrochrome is what this would support because ferrochrome you'd record it in standard and you'd play it back in the chrome setting But I'm going to clean that switch on the bottom and then put this back together and we'll do some testing on this thing So this is the tape selector switch this one Get my cleaner in there And no, I'm not going to uh, replace all the caps on this thing. Not at this point, anyway. You know, that might be a, a project for some other day, but today I just want to see if this thing works and how well it works and get the board back in here. Make sure that my switches activate. Get up, line these up. Get the The switch is lined up so that when I move the solenoid, that switches make sure that they move. Oops. That's come apart. As you can see, what's happened here is the solenoid has actually come disengaged. I have to uh, get the pin back in there. And get the, uh, there we go, get that back in place. Okay, now I can now I can align the switches and get them in place. Um, that happened because I turned the unit over to uh, work on the other side. I think is what happened there. So I got to hold this in place and get these switches up in place so that they're lined up and get the other switch on this side in place. I need three hands to do this. Okay, I think I got it. I think I've got it now. This switch will activate. Good. 
I'll put like one one or two screws in just to hold it in place so that I can verify that my solenoid is going to operate the switches as it's supposed to. Okay, that switch operates. That switch works. And yeah, make sure that these two switches activate. Looks like they do. These two switches are going to activate. Now I got to plug this board back in. And of course, I have to take this bracket off to do that. I watch something else fall off when I do this. this. This bracket is what holds that board in place when the bottom board is in place. So this has to come off. Of course it's going to drop down there and into everything else. Okay, now I should be able to plug the board in. Okay, and then the top piece goes back on. That's the support that holds the board in place so it doesn't touch anything. That sounds good. Let's uh, put a tape in that I can record on and we'll uh, see how this thing records. I think there's already some stuff recorded on the beginning of this tape so we'll just uh, fast forward past it so I have a blank section to work with. So we'll just find a blank place on this tape and we'll make some recordings. I'm queued up, ready to record. I'm in record pause. I I press the record, I got pause on here, so pause, record, now I'm in record pause, and I've hit play, it should get ready to record, and now I'm ready to release the pause button, when I release the pause button, I can start my, rec my playback, I've got my counter at zero, we'll put the memory on, I'm going to record it with Dolby noise reduction turned on, but no MPX filter because I'm not recording it off the radio, so release pause, and we'll start the music. Let's uh, replay it. <clears throat> I was a little bit hot there on the peaks. I just want to see how well it handles. And remember, I haven't, uh, I haven't cleaned the heads or anything on this. So this is how it's going to sound before it's even been cleaned. clean the heads on this thing first and then we'll try another recording uh, we'll, we'll record something else but I'm gonna set my levels a little bit better because I, I was really quite hot there uh, I'll try it again uh, I'll clean the heads and I'll try it again I'll set the peaks so we're gonna peak around plus three because this is a normal tape if it was a chrome tape I could push it but this is not a chrome tape so I'm not expecting to be able to really go into serious oversaturation with a regular tape so we won't push it quite as hard I want to see how, how much how much I get back I should get back close to what I put in, 
on this deck, but let's clean the heads on it first. So being a front loading machine, the heads are right in the front here, which should be relatively easy to get at, to clean. The fact that this unit has a mirror, it makes seeing what you're doing actually quite easy because you can get in here, you can bend the Q-tip a bit, but you can see what you're doing because there's a mirror. You can actually see that you're actually cleaning the head. And here's the erase head over here. And of course the, the caps and shaft and the pinch roller. Which is not the easiest to get at because the pinch rollers is actually kind of hard to get at on this deck to clean. You can get in there but it's not the easiest thing to see what you're doing. As you can see, it's fairly, uh, it's fairly dirty. I think I got it fairly clean. Okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll load it up. We'll put it back in. Record pause. going to show like this. I'm going to set my peak level so that I'm going to peak just at like plus three. Okay, that's got my levels peaking up at about plus three. Average is going to be like that, a little lower. Peak level set, we'll cue the music. Whoops, cue, pause, counter zero, record, and start the music. I'll let this play and uh, we'll play it back when it's done. Okay, let's take a listen to uh, how it sounds now that it's uh, been redone with the proper levels. There, that looks a little better. And you know what, we're getting back pretty much what we put into it, because I had it peaking at, you know, just over zero. Sounds good. I mean, it's 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 a standard uh, it's a standard tape. So, if I were to record this on a ferrochrome or a high bias tape, it's going to obviously sound better than a regular cheap front of the mill tape. This is just a Fuji, you know, DR chrome or not chrome, normal position cheap, you know, iron oxide tape. So, it, for that, it's it's sounding fine. I mean, I, I have no complaints over this. You gotta remember, this was 1976, and uh, cassette decks really got into their prime uh, when metal tape was developed, when Dolby C was developed, when Dolby S was developed. That's when cassette decks really, uh, the, the quality really took off. But uh, this thing here, oops, it sounds good. Turn off the Dolby and it's not, the high frequencies come up quite a bit. Which, come on, I mean, admit it, everybody did that, right? They recorded with Dolby on. And they played it back with Dolby off so you get a little higher frequencies, but yeah, it sounds good. Another trick everybody used to do was their chrome tapes, right? They'd record with the chrome switch on and then they'd play it back in normal mode to bring up the high frequencies. That was all the cheats that we used to do because it would sound better to the ear. Anyway, hey, this thing sounds fantastic for, you know, especially considering the age of it. Even 
notice things like the the sensor light here, for example, that detects when the uh, tape had stopped moving. Ta-da! It screws in. It's a screw-in light bulb. That's all that it is. So we made replacing that a snap. The other lights, they are fuse type bulbs, cartridge bulbs as we sometimes call them, or fuse lamps. But again, they're all easy to replace. And on a deck like this, I wouldn't consider replacing these lights uh, with LEDs. Just because this is a heritage machine, and a heritage machine needs to stay original. The incandescent bulbs have to stay because it's a heritage machine. If it was one I didn't give a crap about, then yeah, I might put LEDs in. But these lamps are easy to replace. They're readily available if I had to replace them. There's two of them here and there's one over here. So there's two of them over here for the meters. You can see them. They just plug in right here. And there's one more over here underneath this cover. And then there's just one back here for the, the auto stop. Uh, easy to replace. They last a long time. I mean, hey, the machine's 42 years old. Light bulbs are still good. I don't know how long, how much service this thing's had. He's told me it hasn't been used in a number of years, but he did tell me that he, when he was using it, this thing was very heavily used. Check the, the power supply back here. It's got four rectifier diodes, so it's got it's got two. Actually, it's got five. These are full wave bridges. There's two diodes in them, so it'll be a, a center tap transformer. So you got one, two, three, four, five um, full wave rectifiers on here, and um, lots of big capacitors here in the power supply. Look at all the shielding. It's just it's just incredible. But I just love it. All these solenoids for every little thing. All these little switches. Got all these little micro switches here. When you change modes, like go to play, right? You got a play solenoid. When you go to pause. You got a pause solenoid, and you go to rewind and fast forward, right? That solenoid operates. I think that one's probably to, is that maybe to take the brakes off? Anyway. And pause. And record is another, another solenoid over here. Yeah, so this thing's got uh, one, two, three, another solenoid on the bottom, four solenoids, two motors. A whole bunch of switches, controls, but everything looks to be in uh, really good shape on this thing. I don't hear any noise. Oh, that control should be clean. We'll clean that control. I'll clean the uh, record level control here. They're easy to get at. They're right here. and the record balance control. Clean those. We do the microphone level control too on the front. It's easy to get at. Check out the controls here. They held on by screws. That's something you don't see. That's something you don't see today. Of course, when you activate any of the switches, you're actually just activating a micro switch here, which controls the solenoid, it controls the mechanism. Total logic control. Love it. You don't see this anymore. You haven't seen this for years. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed my techniques. 676 cassette deck by Panasonic. This is when Techniques was a real stereo company and uh, before the quality started to slip because of course the bean counters got involved and they had to start making stuff cheaper. But this is back in the days when they pulled out all the stops and turned out some really high-end equipment. If you want to support my channel you can do so either through PayPal or through Patreon. The address is at the back there how you can 
support my channel and ensure that I, I continue to make high quality videos for years to come. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you again in the next one real soon.